That's good. Good morning, all. Good morning. Good morning. It is, it is the thick of summer. Who's enjoying, who's enjoying the, the swimming weather, the inner tube floating weather, the sweating weather? Oh, that last one was a trick question. If you're sweating, you shouldn't be enjoying it. And if you are enjoying sweating, uh, they'll, uh, we have a licensed counselor in the building uh, who, can, who can be helpful to you there. So uh, just, just to start off with, um, gosh, uh, life's hard, isn't it, a lot of the time? Challenge upon challenge upon challenge, and we are quick to remember when things are hard, you know, when, uh, when, uh, when the little ones, you know, when my kids come up to me, they generally don't come up to me and say, hey, dad, the, the bug bite stopped itching. They generally come up and say, hey, dad, the bug bite started itching because we, we remember the hard things and, we, and we're, when we're quick to forget when things get better. But I wanted, to, I wanted to do a couple things get better. Can I share some praise reports? Can I share some praise reports? Somebody here had battled, battled, battled against some closed doors to get meaningful employment. And they just completed first full week, first full week of full, of full meaningful employment in their area of study, right? Like God, 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 opened, God opened that opportunity, but not to somebody sitting on their haunches. It took courage to move forward. Um, there's, 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 those, there's those in the congregation right now today that, that were uh, having, their, having their housing sold out from underneath them, and they were having to, in a very difficult market, find new housing. And who knows, housing is super easy right now. Readily available, affordable, people are reasonable. <laughs> Three false answers in a row. That's like a turkey if you're bowling, right? So, so George and Jerry just had an offer accepted on a house. They, they've, they've not only uh, been able to find, find the next temporary thing, they've been able to find something permanent. That is amazing. That is amazing. It is a, it is a tough, tough market out there. I know those who have had... <sighs> relief from physical troubles that are on them. There's a, there's a family within the church that, that all fell sick with COVID and nobody had to go to hospital, even though it was hard on them. That is a blessing. That is a real blessing. I had a friend, and I, I hope you see, I try to stay away from, I start, try to stay away from divisive things that are not the key elements that we want to talk about. I had a friend I've known for, 21, 22 years, 34-year-old man, died of COVID this week, right? It, it, it's okay, he knew the Lord, but when we're talking about how things can go, they can go that way too. So sometimes when things go right, we forget, oh friend, it is good for the soul not to forget, to remember, to remember the day that you get to put two, two feet in two shoes is a good day, a day to be thankful for, right? And that has a way not only of being honoring to God, but transformative to us. This, this, this open hand that we recognize that the good things that we've been given, I have not earned a darn dirty one of them, not really, not really. I'm no better than anybody else, and yet there are so many people in worse positions. You know, God loves them too, and He wants to He wants to to tend them as well. I'm so glad I can be tended. So let's just give God a quick round of applause for He is tending His people. <laughs> Amen. So, so um, uh, we're in Acts 10 today. Uh, if any of you are super studious and you read ahead, you'll see that Acts 10 is absolutely chock full of some interesting things. We're actually going to take a half step back and catch the last little section of Acts 9 and then roll through Acts 10. And I've, I've titled the message today something near and dear to my heart, which is hungry. 
which is hungry. I will assure you that all of you will be transformed by this message, and you will be hungry by the end of it, for it is lunchtime at that point. So uh, with, with, the, with the young man that passed away this, this week, it was, uh, I, was, I was taking stock, um, you know, looking back, remembering. And when I used to be the college pastor uh, up, at a, up at a church in Bellevue, that's where I knew the young man who, who passed away uh, 20 some odd years ago. And he was actually, he was actually the third of my young people uh, to have passed away. And I was thinking, boy, that's for not a very, for not a very large, large group. That's, that's a lot. And I was remembering back to uh, another one that passed away. He was, a, he was a gentle young man. His name was Ian. And I think it'll be fair to, fair to share the story. So, Ian, um, before we do this, has anybody ever seen Napoleon Dynamite? Napoleon Dynamite, right? Do you remember Kip? Yes, I love technology. Kip, right? He was the prototypical skinny white computer programmer about this wide. He was, he was exactly what you would think when you think uh, uh, tube socks and sandals at Microsoft, right? You, you would think these things. So Ian was exactly Kip, precisely Kip. And in Napoleon Dynamite, Kip had a girlfriend who drove out, caught a Greyhound bus from Detroit and showed up. And Kip, little skinny, little skinny white dude, just, you know, big birth control glasses, you know, the whole thing. And that's a funny one, right? So, and then, and then, then his girlfriend shows up from Detroit. And she is, she is voluptuous and soulful, right? Her name was, I think, like LaFonda, right? And I swear to you, I, I'm telling you, Ian was from Detroit, and his friend who was a girl showed up from Detroit, and her name was Angel, and she was LaFonda. It was amazing. And it was like, can we say it? Is it okay to say? Everybody, but I mean, like, the movie is still current and fresh. Oh, my goodness. But the, the, this, these are just fun stories. It's real life. This is how you know it's historical. So the thing, though, about Ian he was a nice young man. He was a gentle young man. He was an intelligent young man. He was allergic to everything. <laughs> everything. He would carry a card with him in his wallet. And we would go out after service and we would go to Red Robin or we would go to a Thai restaurant or we'd go to a pizza parlor, something like that. And Ian, without missing a, without missing a beat, he would take out his card and he says, hi, my name's Ian. Uh, please give this to your chef. These are a list of my allergies. All of them will put me in the hospital. Could you please advise me on what I could eat? And I never see a waiter or a waitress that actually knew what to do with that. They're like, huh, might kill you. Um, I'm going on break. <laughs> Dead people don't tip, right? <laughs> but it was, always, it was always a challenge because when you go out with somebody who has such significant allergies, these are not negotiable things. These are not preferences. Ah, oh, well... You know, I really felt like chicken, but I guess, I guess fish is okay. It's not that. This is, this is clear line in the sand, cannot be crossed, firm. And it made it challenging to include Ian sometimes when you're going out. Because you knew there was this clear line in the sand when you sat down at the table that he could not cross. With that as a backstory, I promise it will connect. Let's dive in. Let's dive into our text. The motif of, of hunger and desire 
This is something that uh, we're going to be bouncing, uh, bouncing through a couple different places in the New Testament. It is, uh, it is significant, it is meaningful, um, and, and they, they tie together in a surprising way. So um, we're going to go ahead and start Acts 9.36 through 1048, right? So there's about 50, 60 verses. I know that's a lot, but there is a lot of stuff going on in this. So as we dive on in, now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. It actually means gazelle. Um, and I, 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 you don't understand sometimes why people do what they do. When they had Tabitha to go with, they continue to refer to her as Dorcas. Really, you could have done gazelle. You could have done Tabitha. But we're going to repeat Dorcas. All right, great. So carry on. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was in Lydda, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all aside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with a man named Simon, who was a tanner. It's an interesting account because it only varies by one letter from another, uh, from another resurrection account. The wording there, he says, Tabitha, arise. Jesus said, Talitha, kum, daughter, get up. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. So a bit of a backdrop on centurions here as we get going. Centurions were, were men of responsibility within the Roman military, and they were over a hundred men. So when they were talking about the characteristics that they would look for in a centurion, they were not looking for the best, most aggressive operator. They were not looking for the most devastating force on the battlefield. They were looking for somebody who could stand and die in a spot keeping his men together, to be steady of mind and consistent. We have another account of Jesus talking to a centurion at another time, who understood authority. He was a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. He was a devout man who feared God with all of his households, and he gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. So a devout man feared God, gave generously, prayed continually, but he was not a Jew. He was part of something that would be called the God-fearers. So within the, Roman, within the Roman military, as is still true today, when people face life and death, they recognize their need for an answer to eternity. So if you've never faced life or death, maybe you haven't considered your need for an answer for eternity. I promise you, when you do, you will consider your need for an answer for eternity. And so, very, very common in that day were for, for people in this area to either choose to follow Mithra, who was a god from Iran, he was a part of Zoroastrianism, Right? He was a God of justice. He was a God of strength. He was these things. Brought a lot of good moral things to the table. It was a main competition within the Roman military for the claims of Christ. But this man learned about, decided to follow the God of the Hebrews. But a stumbling block when you're trying to follow the God of the Hebrews, when you're not Hebrew. This is hard. 
You're a little bit on the outside, as we saw earlier with the Hellenists. You're a little bit on the outside. And then there's the whole matter of circumcision. Ugh. These are challenging topics. Gave generously to the people, devout, feared God, prayed continually. And about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? In terror, right? The man who was chosen to be steady, who would stand in one spot and die and keep his hundred men together to accomplish what was necessary. This man who gave generously, who prayed continually, he stared at him in terror. What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. I do find it interesting that both with Dorcas, the gazelle, Tabitha, that her good deeds were remembered. That all of those who were around her on her deathbed, they're like, but she was so kind. She made me this. She made me that. She cared for us. And God reached out in a special way to her. To Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before the God that you fear and serve. Now, go and get Simon. He's lodging with another Simon. A tanner whose house is by the sea. I've actually been inside this house on a trip to Israel. So that doesn't, that's just free, right? That doesn't really change anything for anybody else. But it, it, it was a significant thing because these are not made up stories. They've kept track of where these, of where these places were because these, these were real historical events. I've been to this house. When, an angel who, when the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier. That is, another God-fearer from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So this man who was respected, who was responsible, he goes and says a crazy thing to people. He was hungry for something. He was hungry. He wanted to know what was the message that Peter had for him. What was the message that God had for him through Peter? The next day they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So he's on top of the tanner's house. I don't know if he went out for a clear view of the sea or because it stinks, you know, because you got a lot of dead animal hides, other unpleasant things that cure with urine. It's not, it's, not a nice, it's not a nice smell. And he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. But while they were making that food for him, while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance, and he saw the heavens opened. And something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him that said, Rise, Peter, get up, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time and said, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened not once, not twice, but three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. We're just going to pause there for a second. So this is an enormous big deal. Because when you're talking about the faith of the Jews prior to Christ, you're talking about a people preserved and set aside. 
They had customs that kept them preserved and set aside. You weren't supposed to intermarry with other religions, with other foreign, uh, foreign uh, men and women, because you weren't, you weren't supposed to be mingled. You're supposed to be set aside. They had kosher rules for keeping table, keeping a kosher table, right? For a long time, for a long time, the only thing that I knew about kosher was those are the best hot dogs. <laughs> Testify. But kosher is much more than being delicious hot dogs. Kosher is restrictive. Oh my goodness sakes, the, the, the level of things that you can't eat, that you have to be so careful with, like, I don't know, anybody, anybody else love somebody who's gluten-free or has some, some sort of, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe vegetarian, maybe vegan, maybe allergies, maybe all these things? Try to go out for a meal with somebody who can't eat what you can eat. This is a challenging thing. This is a challenging thing. And God gave these kosher rules to the people it appears, in part, <clears throat> to help keep table time separate. Because if you're sitting with somebody, if you're sharing life with somebody, you grow attached to them. So this is a little bit of an extrapolation. You'll have to bear with me. I still think it's right. Because he wasn't supposed to marry. It's really hard or it's, it's really hard to marry somebody if you're not dating somebody. It's really hard to date somebody if you don't sit down and have some table time with them. Right? So these sort of hedge rules, we see this within restrictive religions. To keep you away from the real sin, they keep you way back here. And in fact, the Jews developed many more of those. Many more of those, say for example, with the Sabbath. They were talking about, you know, so, so Jesus, or Jesus, uh, you know, uh, God in the Old Testament gives the Ten Commandments, talks about honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy. What does that mean? Don't work on the Sabbath. Okay, well, what's work? <sighs> really? You don't know what work is for? If you want to get paid, it's work, right? You know, it could be that simple, but it isn't that simple. Because people are like, well, I want to do this, I want to do that, right? So they, they actually boiled it down to how far you could walk on the Sabbath without it being work. It's called a Sabbath's day journey. They broke it down to how much you could labor on the Sabbath for necessary things. They broke it down so much to say that it was the, the effort that it would take for the smallest member that is a little pinky on, an, on a child a week old if it took more than the pinky of a baby to move it, it was work. You weren't supposed to cook on the Sabbath. You were supposed to, you were supposed to cook before, eat what was left over. I had a friend, gosh, everybody's dead. This is so sad, right? Um, Amanda, I went to, I was, I was a youth with her. Uh, at the church that I got saved at, and she was in, in Israel uh, living as a missionary among the Jews. She married uh, into a Messianic Jewish uh, household, and she would have to keep kosher. She would have to, to keep Sabbath. Did you know Amanda? Yeah, Amanda, Amanda Elk? Yeah, she died. Yeah, it's sad. We'll, we'll talk over table. We'll eat, the, we'll eat the same thing. It won't be kosher. <laughs> so... She loved the Lord, right? So we, 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 we suffer differently when we move to our reward than when we simply move to the grave. These are the different things. So kosher made it hard to sit down together with people. He wasn't actually really supposed to be hanging out in the tanner's house not without going through ritual cleansing later before he could do anything because there's all sorts of icky things See reference animal skins and urine inside a tanner's house. These are not temple purity allowed sort of items. But God sends him this vision. And he says, all these things that were unclean, that I wanted in place to keep you as a people set apart, that because your purity was about your 
external avoidance of corruption. Now your purity comes through my application of blood on your life. I now hunger for these people too. Peter, you were hungry to eat. I'm going to show you what that is in fullness. In fact, just for funsies, right? let's, let's look at Luke 22, where we're talking about the Lord's Supper. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Why would he desire that? This is, a, this, is, this is a clear precursor to suffering for the man, to great turmoil and hardship. It's because this was the gateway to his passion, which was to reach more, that everyone should have an opportunity to come to the table. So, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And a voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, so it's not just you, right? Like, you ever, you ever you, like, God, I think I heard you, but I'm confused. So saith Peter. As to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, they stood at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for you coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in as his guests. And the next day he rose and he went away with them and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And he went on the following day, they entered Caesarea and Cornelius was expecting them. And he had called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and he found many persons gathered. Okay, so this is pretty cool. So Cornelius, who was on the outside still, God reaches out to, to say, come into the inside. I see your heart. I see where the direction's going. I now have a way in to, the, to my close presence for you. And Cornelius not only spilled his guts to two of his servants and one of his fellow soldiers. Do you know if you have a hundred soldiers under you and you say to one of those soldiers, hey, I've seen a vision and this just played out. That better come to pass. What are those other 99 going to think if it doesn't come to pass? The next time you say to them, charge, take that hill. Stand in this position against that superior force. They're going to be like, yeah, do you see another vision, vision there, nut job? Cornelius really put his neck out here, and then he doubled down. So he went and he called together his relatives and close friends. He, he wasn't shy about it. He's like, I've heard from God, and I want you to hear from God too. I can't believe this is happening. Come on. He was hungry for other people to hear. Peter said, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Oh, 
Speaking as a white person, how about the brown people? Speaking as a brown person, how about the white people? Speaking as a conservative, how about the liberals? Speaking as a liberal, how about the conservatives? Speaking of those who disagree with me. God says he's hungry for all of them. Not to stay how they are. Not one. All of them to come under his household and to learn his ways. But no longer excluded because of their starting point. For when I was sent, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said four days ago about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, radiant clothing, glory that, clothing that was luminous, radiant, shining, white as white can be. Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. I tell you what, a preacher's dream right there. You got people gathered saying, just tell us what God has to say. We are listening. Oh, just tell us what God has to say. We are listening. You know, other than like Philip on the road with the, with the eunuch, who's, who's kicking it there just going, really, I mean, how can I understand it unless somebody can explain it to me? I guess I wish there was a teacher. Let me rub this lamp. Maybe it'll get granted. And then he believed. And so these people, too. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. For the word that he has sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And you yourself know, and there we get into, we get into, uh, so the term for these things that I love so much is kerygma. It's like a proclamation. You know, Stephen breaking it down, Peter breaking it down, Peter breaking it down again, giving a clear declaration of the truth claims of Christ, right? You yourself know what happened throughout all Judea, bringing from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to, the, all, the, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, as he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. And to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him and receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, and this, is, this, this will still give people trouble because we like to have boxes, don't we? I, I like to have boxes. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I'm not gonna, uh, and, then, and then working in warehouses for years made it worse, right? You know, I like to have straight lines, edges, level. Like, so I like to have boxes, you know normally how it happens, you proclaim with your mouth, you're baptized in water, and then the Spirit fills you. Like that's the normative sort of thing. But here we have, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. 
for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to remain for some days. Can anyone withhold water for being baptized, for baptizing these people? That the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. The stretch of this, the wildest imagination, when you go to the temple, to the only place where God's presence properly dwelt for proper worship in those days, there's outer courts that kept the worst out, the least clean, the least proper. And then there were inner courts where you could come in a bit farther if you were a bit more betterer. Unless you had a limp, unless you were physically impure, unless, unless, unless. And then all the way in, one guy, once a year, and with great fear. And when Jesus died, the, the farthest, most secretist, most <sighs> limited access area was a veil. And behind that, the mercy seat. And when Jesus died on the cross, that veil though it was, oh, it's something crazy. It's like 60 feet high, very, very thick cloth. It was big doings. It tore right from top to bottom so that the boundary was gone. And so now the Gentiles who couldn't even come in, there was a blooming sign on the outside of the Temple Mount that said, foreigners, if you come past here and die, you've been warned. We're going to kill you if you come past here, foreigners. And now, even the Gentiles received the very spirit that dwelt behind the veil, inside the inner sanctum, inside the inner courts, inside the temple mount. God is hungry that a few should be saved. Nope, nope, nope. God is hungry that everyone should be saved. John 6.35. Now granted, not everyone will be saved because not everyone will choose to take up the offer that Christ is making. And that's a great sadness. Because it's there for them. It's there for me. It's there for you. It's there for your coworker you don't like, your neighbor who doesn't like you, for the foreigner. So John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that have seen me and yet do not believe, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that some who look on the Son and believe in Him. Nope. That most who look on the Son and believe in Him. Stop it, preacher. That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Matthew 5, 6. This shouldn't be bumming you out. This should be just straight awesome. This, this, I mean, this is... This is amazing news. This is my righteousness does not depend on my legalistic keeping kosher, keeping Sabbath, honoring every custom 
being a, being, a, being a Judaizer, being a Gnostic, none of that nonsense. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. But wait, who can possibly be satisfied for righteousness? Who gets it all right all the time? Even the rich young man turned out to be proud of himself and was a little obnoxious and ended up not getting it right. But Jesus loved him. So it isn't his righteousness of deeds. It's Christ's righteousness of blood that pours over each and every one of us without going, to the, without going and reading the whole thing. I'm remembering, I'm remembering Zacchaeus, who even though he was... He, even though he was a Jew, he had ostracized himself from community by putting money first instead of being part of his community. Jesus called out to him. How about the woman at the well in John 4, who was a Samaritan woman, who was on the outside? They didn't even agree where the temple should be. And then she was a woman, so Jesus wasn't really supposed to be talking with her. And then not only talked with her, he wanted to, 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 to have water from her. He calls to the ones on the outside to come in. He calls on the ones on the inside to open up. And he calls us all to change in his likeness. Because our righteousness stops being from our own deeds. It starts being from His atoning covering over us. But when we are under His covering, when we've been given a new nature, new things should be natural. Right? So if you're trying to stop drinking whiskey, because whiskey's got a hold of you, right? And you come to Christ and you get a new nature, it should have less hold of you. You shouldn't focus on getting whiskey out of your life. You should focus on getting Christ in your life. And whatever false peace that this is bringing is replaced by a true peace that comes from the true promises of God. Now, I'm not legalistic. I'm not trying to get in all your business about everything. But when you come to Christ, and you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. You will be changed. You get a new nature. It all comes together. So what are we hungry for? What are we hungry for is the question that comes back to it. Are we hungry for someone's attention? Are we hungry for our own pleasure? Do we greatly desire to hear from God? Because God greatly desired you. He greatly desired you like a hunger. He greatly desired me like a hunger. And he promises with our new nature that our hungers start to be for him. Oh, that's a lot better than the other thing. Oh, that's so, so much better than the other thing. So it's a fulfillment also of something that Jesus talked about before too, about how in, in Mark 7, when they're talking about the cleanliness of food, that it's not the things that go into you that make you clean or dirty. It's the things that come out of you. So, gut check gut check moment as we just close our eyes quiet our hearts and talk to God in your life right now what fruit are you seeing is there sweet water coming out of the springs of your life is there bitter water coming out of the springs of your life? I've got no judgment for you on it, but I do have a promise for you on it instead. The availability. If you're seeing anger, 
that you don't understand or can't control. Worry that you don't understand or can't control. Indulgence that you don't understand or can't control. In all of these things, Jesus says he has a better hunger for you. A hunger for him and for his presence. A hunger to honor and to be in the family. So, I'm just going to assume that each and every honest heart here is going to say this morning, without any raising of hands or making eye contact, that each and every honest heart in this room this morning would say, Lord, would you sweeten my spring? Would you let me tap more into you and your resources? Would my nature be changed into the new creation that you have for me, that much more. Would you deepen my love for you so that as I go about my day, that my hunger would not be to make the day disappear, that it wouldn't be to get even with those who are wronging me, that my deepest hunger would be to please the one who loved me so. Lord, would you let all of our hearts shift towards you in this. Deepen my understanding about how you love me so that my choices are informed by that level of joy and appreciation and awe that somebody could love me so. Oh, how you loved me. And then, Lord, help me recognize you love the people next to me and around me the same way and you hunger for them to be found. Lord, would you be with us this week that we could be just vessels of whatever you want to do? Lord, I don't ask you to help me serve you this week. I ask that I can help serve you this week. Can I, help, can I be part of what you've got going on in my family, in my work environment, in my school, in my neighborhood, in my personal relations. Lord God, can I, just, can I just be part of what you want to do in these things? Can I just come to you like a child, just expectant that you have a plan, and isn't it good that you don't disappoint? Lord, would you be with those who are traveling and give them mercy? Safe travel, Lord God. Would you keep them from sickness? Would you keep them from wildfire, from, from accident, Lord, that those who are, who are vacationing, that you would be with them so that they could refresh and make memories, Lord God. Relationships are a gift from you. Creation is a gift from you. Lord, we pray for those around us as, as there always seems to be some hard news report. Lord, will we trust in you even when times are hard? In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, have a great week. Do, do pause and remember the ways that God touches you in your life and provides for you. God says this is a good thing. Stones of remembrance. Ebenezer's, if you're an Old Testament fan, you know, to, to remember how he loves you. Thursday nights, come on out. Work party coming up next Saturday. Adjust your plans. It'll be great. VBS, really looking forward to it. Um, and I've even signed up to be involved in that. So uh, you know, the kids will have some traumatic memory, uh, and it will be my fault. So have a great week, all.